sing several of the verses. Could you turn to verse 3, uh, Deacon Karen, of Jesus Loves Me? And this is one that is especially meaningful to Connie. Jesus loves me, loves me still, though I'm very weak and ill. From his shining throne on high comes to watch me where I lie. And then the last verse, Deacon Karen, which speaks of the promise which has sustained Connie. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. If I love him when I die, he will take me home on high. And when I'm with Connie in that little room at Cedars Nursing Home, I really sense the presence of Jesus. And I know that he's waiting there, being with her through her last days and hours, and ready to walk her home into heaven. And Jesus is not there just for Connie and for those who are dying, but Jesus is with us all, all the time even when we cannot feel his presence. And there are times when we are so numbed with pain and so deep in despair that we cannot feel his presence. I know that I hit bottom when my husband suddenly died. I was numb. I just couldn't believe that he was gone in 20 minutes from a blood hemorrhage to the brain. And I was just shaking my head, and I couldn't feel the presence of Jesus or anyone. So the next morning I woke up, and I did something I rarely do. I just opened my Bible and said, oh, God, speak to me. And it flipped open to Isaiah 54, and verse 5 reads, For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name. And I felt Jesus wrap his arms around me and lead me through John's funeral and every day since. Jesus is with us all the time. He loves us so much that he wants to live with us forever. Can you imagine wanting to have us as roommates forever? Not just for a time of marriage or a release, but forever. And when we look at what Jesus has to say to us, He said this to us all the night that he was betrayed, the night before he died. He looked at his friends who he knew would leave him and desert him, and we have often left Jesus and turned against him. And he said to them, do not let this rattle you. You trust God. Don't you trust me? There is plenty room for you in my father's home. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so you can live where I live, and you already know the road I'm taking. Now, Jesus has a room for all of us, and often that word room, which is tazane, is mistranslated as mansions um, are because the people think that they're going to get mansions or isolated estates in heaven. There's no isolation in heaven. We're just getting rooms in God's big house, apartments in God's big house. We're going to have to live with God and with one another forever. There's no isolating off in our own private mansion. And Jesus uses the word rattled. Don't let your hearts be rattled. And that's the same word that is used when he finds that Lazarus is dead. It says that Jesus was rattled, was grief-stricken. And when he spoke about Judas betraying him, he used that same word, rattled. He was just shaken because He was felt so alone, betrayed by one of his own twelve that he had loved and been with night and day for three years, sleeping on the ground outside, eating food with all the time. This was the same person who would betray him and see him crucified. And Jesus spoke of being rattled. And he tells us, don't be rattled. Don't be upset. Believe in God. And trust me, I know that I'm going to leave you, but I'm going
going to prepare a place for you, a room for you in God's own house, a room for all of you. And there's room for us who are even struggling with our faith. And as Peter did, all that we have to do is follow the way that Jesus points out to us. And he tells us next, when Thomas says, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? Thomas expected a map, a instructions, or their version of a GPS. If we're going to get there, God, you have to give us directions because we get lost easy. And Jesus had been guiding them step by step for three years all around Galilee and Palestine. Why was he not telling them directions now? But Jesus said to them, I am the railroad, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him. You have even seen him. What Jesus means when he says, I am the road, is that sin brought a big gulch between us and God, a big chasm between us and God. We were here and God was there. And we could not get close to God because our sins, our darkness, our choosing destruction kept us away from God. And Jesus on the cross spanned that chasm. He became the bridge over our sins, leading us directly to God so that we don't have to live in guilt and shame anymore. We can walk over that cross to God's arms. It's done with. Our past is truly the past. We are freed from our sins and from all the shame that it brought. And, you know, Connie didn't live a perfect life. She was overwhelmed with guilt for not having raised her two children, Lila and Roman, who were taken away from her when, she, when they were young. And she tried to soothe herself with addictions, which only brought more destruction into her life. Then she came to this church and started coming again and again. And we worked with her and she reached out to Roman and Lila and said to them, please come and see me. She was recently diagnosed with cancer. She said, I want to see you before I die. And Roman said, perhaps I can come. I'm in jail now, I'll try to get out to see you. And Lila said, no way. Not after what you did to me, Mom. You abandoned me. You left me in the hands of an abusive father. I want nothing to do with you. And Connie, I just told her to pray to the Lord Jesus. Pray that his forgiveness would overwhelm Lila's heart. And I was there when Lila and Roman came to visit her. And they hugged her. And they kissed her. And they said, I love you, Mom. And then we stood in a circle of prayer and prayed for Connie and thanked God for this reunion, for this broken family. Jesus was a bridge over that troubled water. He brought forgiveness into that family so that Connie can die in peace, surrounded by her children, knowing they forgive her, that the past is truly the past, she doesn't need to use drugs or alcohol or sex to get rid of her pain anymore. She can live free, knowing that she's reunited with those she loves. This is what Jesus does. He is the road to freedom from sin. He is our bridge over our troubled waters. And all of us have troubled waters, whether it's with our family or friends, whether it's with our jobs, or our finances, or our addictions, or our overeating, or our lying, or our stealing, or our gossiping, or whatever bad habits we have, we're all addicted to something. We all try to soothe ourselves from our pain by doing something that's destructive to us. And Jesus comes and heals that. 
he gives us a bridge over troubled waters to let us be free from our addiction. He is the road to life, and he is also the truth. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat what he has to say to us. He doesn't tell us that everything is perfect. He tells us like it is. He tells us when others are really hurting us and when we are hurting ourselves. He shows us our faults. As much as we don't want to hear it, Jesus will tell us our own mistakes. I know because when I've prayed to Jesus, he's held up a mirror to me and said to me, Liz, you are so judgmental. You always want to be better than anybody else. You just want to feel superior. And I have cried out and said, Lord, take that sin from me. And he has said to me, vision yourself standing at the foot of the cross, which is level, when you're all shoulder to shoulder. You don't have their sins, but they don't have your sins. And you're all sinners. This is the truth that Jesus tells us. We are all sinners saved by his love and grace, saved by his death on the cross. None of us leaves a perfect life. As hard as we try, many of us struggle constantly, and all of us struggle, for we have our own faults buried within us, something that we want to hide from others. But Jesus, who is the truth, reveals it to us and helps us to heal. And that healing renews our lives and our love and deepens our forgiveness, not only for others, but ourselves. And lastly, Jesus is the life. He gives us not only truth and forgiveness, but he gives us a joy in living. We can wake up each day knowing that this is a new beginning. We don't have to carry our sins with us. We can constantly be forgiven. Jesus will give us everything we need to start a new day. We don't have to carry the past on our backs. We are free to start each day fresh, healed, and redeemed in the love of Jesus. And then Jesus tells us, not only that he is the road, the truth, and the life, but that we know the Father through him. Now, it's in the Old Testament, Moses asked to see God's face, and God says, it would stop your heart to see me. I'm so awesome that if you had a look at me, you would drop dead. But Moses said, but I need to know, Lord, that you're close to me. So God put him in a crack in a rock and put his hand over him and let Moses see the backside of God. But we have Jesus who looks like us, who has our eyes, our skin, our hands, our hearts, our noses, our mouths, our feet, who is like us. We have an image of Jesus as we have no image of God. We can see Jesus, and Jesus is God. So we have what Moses could not even have. We have the front of God, the full beauty of God in Jesus. And that beauty of Jesus is, leads us every day to fall more in love with him, to be able to trust him with our sins and with our past and with a new beginning. And Jesus becomes our all in all. Every day should be a day with Jesus. And I'm reminded of a story Reverend Sharon Williams, my friend from Brooklyn, who preached for us one of our anniversaries, told me about her son Dantas being interviewed by the Sunday school teacher. And the Sunday school teacher said to Dantas in front of the class, Dantas, what did you learn today? And he said, Jesus. And he said, she said, well, what lesson sticks out in your mind most that you learned in Sunday school? And he said, Jesus. 
And she said, Dantes, what do you want to learn next week? And he said, Jesus. And she said, Dantes, I'm tired of you giving me the same answer for everything. Don't you have an other answer other than Jesus? And Dantes said, Jesus answers everything. Out of the mouth of children comes the truth. Jesus answers everything. Jesus is the answer to our empty wallets. Jesus is the answer to our exhaustion. Jesus is the answer to our struggle with our friends and family. Jesus is the answer to our health problems. Jesus is the answer to everything in our lives. Jesus is the answer. And we see this in not only the lives of ourselves, but in the lives of others. I read recently a story about John F. Kennedy. <coughs> that 79 years ago, he was in the PT accident off the Solomon Islands. Some of you may have heard about it, where a Japanese destroyer rammed into his patrolling boat and cut it in half. And he and 10 of his men clung to the hull of that boat. And then they finally paddled it to a deserted island in the Solomon Islands. And there, all they could find was a couple of coconuts to eat and sour coconut milk to drink. And they paddled to each island for over a week and back again, trying to find a reconnaissance ships from the American crews, and they never found one. And they were starving on these coconuts and the sour milk, and they were about at the end of their rope when onto their island came a canoe with two Solomon natives there who were working undercover for the Americans. And they brought them food, and then they took Kennedy's message back to the nearest PT station, which was from New Zealand. And the New Zealand commander sent a message back to Kennedy saying, come with us, come with these men, hide in their canoe, and we will get your men off the island as soon as possible. And so Kennedy went back on the bottom of their boat, under the brush, under their fishing gear, hiding from the Japanese, who were soaring overhead and went to the New Zealand commander and then led them back to the lonely, deserted island where the rest of his men, the 10 of his men, were waiting. And as they got on the PT boat, two of the Solomon Islanders and one of the Americans began singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Now, Jesus saved John F. Kennedy and those two ten men from death on that deserted island. He sent those Solomon Islanders to the, see them. He sent those New Zealand PT people nearby to rescue them. It's Jesus who is there with us every day, holding our hands, walking us through our difficulties, supporting us, giving us the joy of every day, being our road, our truth, and our life. Let us now stand and pray that we can claim Jesus every moment of our lives so that we will not be overwhelmed by our past, or confused by our present, or fearful of our future, but know that Jesus is with us. Let us pray. Oh Jesus, you are our road, our truth, and our life, now and forever. May we keep walking on your bridge. That may your cross overwhelm our guilt and shame. May we accept our total forgiveness for our sins. May we forgive ourselves because you have forgiven us. And what greater price could you pay than to die for us?
Our sins are not greater than your death. Give us the courage to face the truth about ourselves, unafraid to admit when we are wrong and willing to change, knowing that we are loved just as we are, but too much to let us stay that way. Fill us with your joyous life, celebrating each day that we can serve you and that you, we can see you loving us, knowing that when we look at you, we are seeing the very face of God. Oh, Jesus, overwhelm us with our love for you. Amen. Amen. Let us now sing. <laughs>